From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. So when I grew up in California, believe it or not, 40s and 50s, we remembered this conversion of our Japanese buddies from being a little bit feared to recognizing they were just like the rest of us, people who had kind of witnessed this big atrocity of World War II. It wrapped up lots of folks who didn't do anything wrong whatsoever. And there's really sort of no better tale about that than those who were incarcerated in Japanese internment camps in California. To speak to this very tender and sensitive issue, our guest today, Akemi Oka, has won an Emmy for a documentary that she made on this very topic. Akemi, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much, Ron, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share this work with you. We are relatively new members of the Yacht Club, and my husband and I were surprised to receive this tremendous recognition. He thought, oh, we should let people know about it, and it's, it's of historical interest, so we thought it might be some, some interesting information for the, the viewers and listeners. You guys are new members, and you've got a daughter who's been sailing. Tell us about your latest sailing activities. Yeah, so we are new members. My husband, Mark, and I joined, uh, I think, just last year. He's really the sailor. I'm a novice sailor, but we are the owners of a, a 36-foot saber that we keep over in Brisbane Marina. And our daughter, who's now 11, maybe it's just to have another deckhand and some crew, but like we wanted to have her uh, learn how to sail. So she's taken a few classes over at the city front to the St. Francis. She went to the overnight camp at Tinsley. This is really about a film that we produced, a very short film called Three Boys Manzanar. The tagline is really that it's a film about reunion and, and remembrance. It stemmed from a family reunion that we were doing in, in 2016. It was my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And they had decided to have a small reunion in Los Angeles. And I'm one of four children. So we were all planning to be there with our families. And we thought, you know, we've never actually gone to Manzanar with my father, which is uh, sort of up the 395 from Los Angeles. We'd never gone there. And, and he didn't talk a lot about it growing up. And we were very curious. We thought maybe this is a time we should do that. The grandchildren, we felt, were old enough to do that kind of a trip. And, and in the planning of that, two things came up. One was that my father actually was in a very famous photo at the time. And the two boys who were in the photo, we understood to still be alive. And so we thought maybe we should try to contact them and have them join us at Manzanar. And then the second thing we thought is because of that, maybe it would be appropriate for us to make a video of this because we thought we want to remember this because it's part of our, our family history and, and sort of an, an important part of our history. You know, I, I didn't want us to all be on our smartphones walking around with our head on a screen instead of being present for the moment. And so I thought we should find someone else who can actually film this. In 2016, we found a filmmaker who actually was volunteering at my daughter's school. She was a documentary filmmaker. Her name is Preeti Mankar Deb, and she agreed to work with us to actually make this film come to life. And so we filmed this short, roughly six and a half minute uh, documentary about my father's time in Manzanar. And he was there from 1942 to 1945, so between the ages of eight and 11. In this picture, you can see Preeti as well as Masha Korpukina, who was our cinematographer. One of the things about my father's time in Manzanar that's unique, maybe from some other people and other internees, is that he's in a really well-known photo. So this photo is entitled Boys Behind Barbed Wire. It is by a photographer named Toyomi Atake, who was actually an internee at Manzanar and had originally smuggled his camera in, but I think for the end of internment was actually allowed to take photos. And this is one of two photos that he took of my father, who was on the far right, as well as two other boys, Bob Takamoto, who's on the left, and Bruce Sensui, who's in the middle. And this was an image that I think through the years become very emblematic of the time in the camp. And one of the things that we decided to do with this film was actually reunite these three boys. But we had learned that both Bob and Bruce were still alive, and the three of them had not been together since the time they left Manzanar. So part of the film was to reunite the three boys at the site where they'd last seen each other. 
the filming was was quite grueling. It was it was only two days, but we were really able to experience the extreme environmental conditions at the site. So it was 100 plus days. We had windstorms. We had dust storms. We had to be careful with the equipment. We, we could have lost some of the, the camera equipment because of the ex- environment. And then we also saw how hard it was on people, like from a human standpoint. We had seniors who were 70 and 80 years old. The three boys in the film were all over 80. And we had young children, you know, four or five, six years old. And it was very hard on them to be in the heat like that. So it gave us an understanding and appreciation of the kind of conditions that people were living in at the camps. The reunion itself was very moving. What you see here is a photo of, uh, I think, the remaining guard tower that they've kept up um, at the National Park at the site. Uh, The photo on the right of the three boys and then a a photo of the three boys now in their 80s. It was interesting because being on site, I think, different kinds of memories and recollections and, and things that we had not heard, certainly from my father. So there's something about being on the site that I think sparked stories from him. For example, I think when he went in, he was eight years old and they were a a little bit of a test group, like a pilot group that went in before the rest of the camp uh, internees. And so they were still building barracks and had a scrap lumber yard on site. The barracks were pretty sparse. They just had a cot and I don't even know if they had furniture. So my father thought, oh, I'll go get some some scrap wood to take to my father. and Maybe we can make tables or chairs or something to sit on. And as he went to try to go get some scrap lumber, he was shot at. And he said, you know, I don't know if I was shot at or if someone was shot at shooting a warning shot, but I ran out of there. It was really a surprising story because we had not heard that from him. And and it was a little heartbreaking to think that, you know, this eight-year-old boy who lost his home, lost all of his possessions, doesn't really know why he's in this place, had such a, a stark warning, picking up a piece of scrap lumber. And then Bruce had also talked about the, when they left the camp, they actually dug a hole underneath their barrack and put all of their possessions that they weren't taking into the hole and covered it up. And so we were able to go onto a, a site that is generally off limits to the public, uh, but we were accompanied by a ranger and found the site that his barracks were, and you could see kind of a a depression. There was something different about like that particular location relative to the others. So I think the Rangers were excited to know that maybe there's some artifacts in there, but you know, these were all things that until you're on site, you you don't really know. I think the other interesting finding was that none of the men really harbored long-term resentment. I think that their age, you know, they were kids. And so they, they didn't really know what they had lost or what opportunities they were missing. They were just kind of in this place. So, so it's been interesting because they don't really have long-term resentment harbored about their time there. So we made this film for ourselves and to capture our family history, but we found that it actually resonated with audiences for a number of reasons. We'd shown this at a few film festivals in the U.S. We got responses from audience members saying that it made them think about citizenship, patriotism, racism, national security, and, and, and the innocence of childhood. Educators in particular were very interested in it because it was so short and they were able to go after all of those, those talking points and students were energized by that. So, you know, and, and I think the Academy also felt strongly about it because it, it did win an Emmy. Um, so this is a photo of my daughter right outside of the, the visitor center and just was, um, I think, just a very emblematic photo of, you know, sort of our film with thinking about children and what it means to be an American and and the historic relevance of this camp. And so I just wanted to talk about a little bit visiting Manzanar. When we went actually to uh, the visitor center, um, we do have a lot of memorabilia and and, uh, information about the site. It it was helpful for us, I think, to be immersed in that, you know, understanding the executive order 9066, understanding sort of the the breadth of of the the camp. So 10 of them were situated across the U.S., populations ranging from six to like, I think, 29,000 at the largest. There, there's even some other history that it forced us to sort of look at. Uh, this is just an image of uh, Fish Harbor on Terminal Island in San Pedro. It was uh, one of the first places to be evacuated once the executive order went in place. This was a village that had been created by Japanese fishermen who were recruited by the canneries. And this village was evacuated because there was fear that the boats could be used as naval craft against the U.S. There were 
a lot of captains and skippers who were familiar with the harbor and coast, very close to a U.S. Navy site. Those folks were evacuated and ended up being placed in assembly centers and then internment camps. Once it got to the assembly centers, they were tagged. Individuals and families were identified by these paper tags. You can see images of the tags as well as families captured together. And, and many of these folks really had 48 hours to gather all their belongings and be ready to go. And they, they really had no idea where they were going, what kind of transportation they were going to, to be on. And so they burned a lot of things and then lost or sold their possessions and, and homes and businesses. And all 120,000 people were interned and two thirds of them were American citizens. One of the interesting things that for us was just to see the scale of the evacuation. So this is a photo of my father in front of a wall that has all the names of the internees. And it was, it was striking to see like how many people were really interned. And then this was also an image of them looking at the uh, diorama in the center, trying to find their barracks and, and understanding kind of where they were. And, and it was it was interesting to see how large that was. I think that Manzanar in the end held about 10 or 11,000 people at its peak. The other thing that was interesting was to look at some of the other aspects of the internees at Manzanar. You know, th there were a lot of older young men who were very interested in proving their patriotism to the U.S. So, you know, there were a number of men, both in Hawaii, but also in the mainland U.S., who had volunteered or were drafted into the military. And a couple of regiments were created that were uh, Japanese American only regiments. And, and to this day, the 442nd and the 100th Battalion fought in Italy and France is one of the highest decorated units of its size and length in U.S. history. The other thing that we saw was just some of the, the aspects of, of family life and particularly uh, children. We were interested in this because my, my father and Bruce and Bob were all around this age when they went into the camps. How did the kids sort of spend their time and, and see this incarceration? And, and like kids, they just kind of did kid things. They played organized sports. They played basketball. Baseball was huge. There were baseball leagues. Uh, so it was interesting to play such an American sport in an incarcerated environment. They played marbles. They played tag. My father talked about looking for arrowheads, bugs and lizards, and, and certainly avoid snakes and scorpions and wildlife. As we looked at you know, how, how, what to do with this film, because it really wasn't made necessarily to be a documentary that we were showing to people, but, but found that it was speaking to a lot of people, we thought maybe we need a bigger audience than film festivals. And so in 2021, we started to reach out to a few public, state, public uh, broadcasting stations. And the film was actually picked up by KVIE in Sacramento and was aired as part of their Sunday story series. So I think it was the last episode in 2021. So this is an image of their, their Sunday story site. They came back to us, said that they'd gotten really good feedback from the film. And if it was the first time we had debuted this on television, that we really should consider applying for uh, an Emmy. And so Michael Sanford and Alice Yu at KVIE really helped us to create our application. We became members of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, and we applied for the San Francisco Northern Re California Regional Emmy because that's where the program was run. We applied, I think found out in May that we had been selected as a nominee and so we attended the Emmy Awards dinner in June. Weren't really sure how it was going to go, but we had applied for the diversity, equity, and inclusion category, which was, I think, the first time that they'd actually run this category in the awards. And so it was one of the last categories of the evening, and uh, there were seven nominees in total. And this is just an image of us learning that we had won the award. Everyone was just thrilled and excited. And, you know, we went up and, and gave our speech. It was incredibly moving. And this is a picture of, of me <laughs> backstage with the Emmy and of my father, which I think was sort of a surreal experience for him to have come to this place where his story is, is worthy of such an honor. And so, you know, I, I think with this recognition, we, we really feel like we have a, a responsibility to share this kind of family history uh, with other people. When we were younger, we used to ask my father about his time at Manzanar. My dad would say, oh, I was really young then, I don't remember. 
And my grandfather would just say, yeah, I, I don't want to remember that time. It was a bad time. And it was this mystery around this hole in their experience that we never understood, that shaped clearly who they were and then in turn who we were. In 1942, 120,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and sent to relocation centers across the United States. There's an iconic photo of three young boys behind a barbed wire fence juxtaposed with being sort of trapped in such a beautiful place. The tall boy in the white shirt is actually my father. My father's now in his 80s, and we found the other two boys in the picture, and we decided that we should get them all together and recreate that photo before we run out of time. When I came to Manzanar, that was in 1942, and I had just turned eight years old. My parents, after the war broke out, were very afraid of what the authorities would think of their allegiance. So they just burned family heirlooms. That was pretty traumatic. I guess you talk about the tragedy of having your government uh, do this to you. In my barracks it was 22-13-1. The inside of the barracks were very small, just a bare room with nothing else except for a cot. When you had a dust storm, sand would come up through the openings. I got up about 5.30 in the morning, went out, took a cold shower, and then went out walking maybe about a mile. I'd come back and go for breakfast, I'd be at the mess hall about 7.30. As a community, we came together as we had to, to survive. It was a strong community. I was neighbors with Bruce. Of course, he was older than me, so I sort of followed him. <laughs> I used to be a pretty good uh, marble player in we used to challenge other kids, play marbles by having a circle. We did the normal thing that all the other kids did, you know, we played marbles or tag game. We used to play basketball. Well, there was one thing I remembered. Bruce and I and a few other boys, we made slingshots. Somebody hit a bird. It was a sparrow. So we took it home to Bruce's mother. She plucked the feathers and all, and she made a meal out of that. So all of us, and there were about six of us, you know, feeding him all that little tiny sparrow. Until you're here, you just don't understand. Today we were in 104 degree heat. We had 40 mile an hour winds and I just, I think about my daughter and my nieces and nephews, all of who, you know, are the ages of when my dad and Bruce and Bob were here. And I think, how could anyone ever have subjected them to that? Like, I can't imagine my daughter out here. And so um, just the perseverance that, that my dad exhibited, it's amazing to me actually. Before we came, it's kind of silly, but I, I sort of prayed, I guess, to my grandfather who was in the camp. And my aunt, my dad's sister, who passed two years ago. And I just said, um, I hope you can help us find some things to show you were here. We were looking at one of the barracks and my brother Ken looked down and said, Hey, Bob, come here. And we looked and we found a marble. And my dad and, and Bruce and Bob talked about they'd play marbles together. And then we were looking for 
the chicken coop that my grandfather built and there were all these cement blocks everywhere and we thought we're never going to find it. I knew my grandfather had marked the spot so we pushed away some dirt and under the corner, under the dirt, my grandfather had inscribed his last name. I think that visiting Manzanar 70 years later is relevant today because it brings to mind what it means to be an American. In some ways, it's ironic because in 70 years, there's a lot that's changed, but there's also a lot that hasn't. And Manzanar just serves as this testament to not only that injustice, but a reminder that we have to see each other as human beings. Congratulations on producing such a tender and emotional, clearly deserving of an Emmy award-winning documentary. I remember as a young boy in the 50s, as we gradually converted from thinking of Japan as a foe that had attacked us in Pearl Harbor, battled with us in the Pacific, and in fact, even attacked the California coast. We've had other Wednesday yachting luncheons, which showed the submarine nets across San Francisco Bay and the attacks on Santa Barbara, et cetera, et cetera. After the conclusion of World War II, America put in place um, economic plans and helped create treaties. And in fact, governance of Japan post-World War II that contributed to the great growth of the Japanese economy. And in fact, creating one of the greatest economies on the planet, you know, a half a century later. How do you feel about the good work that, you know, America did as a victor becoming an ally? What do you, how fair did you think that treatment was of the citizens of Japan? I think that's important. I mean, I, I think that that is where um, America's strength comes from, right? Is in helping other countries to realize their democratic potential. And so helping companies to rebuild after something as devastating as, as war, I think is, is an important part of building trust and goodwill into the future. My father is a survivor of his heavy cruiser Vincennes being sunk in Guadalcanal, one of the more famous naval battles in history. Three Japanese torpedoes sunk it in less than one hour. My dad swam in the water for two nights and two days until rescued, not able to get on a lifeboat, but holding on to the outside of a lifeboat as his compatriots were eaten by sharks, literally. All those people felt pretty aggressively upset about our uh, you know, one-time cross-Pacific neighbor, the Japanese attacking us. And can you imagine how they felt about anybody who looked like the attackers and what they thought they should do to be safe after such an attack and during such a big war. Yeah, I, I think I can understand that, especially I think in the context of the 40s. You know, I, I think that you could point to more recent events that are similar, 9-11 maybe being one of them. But 9-11 has the benefit of looking back at, at history, right? And how how the country and other countries have responded to aggression. So now I want to say, I consider Japan to be an incredibly valuable ally. And they have demonstrated that they were worthy of the trust we put into them after World War II. And your movie is all the more poignant as we think about our dear friends who are Japanese in America, who are American people of Japanese origin, and who've contributed so much to our culture. One of America's Enduring strengths is our diversity. We are the most interesting people in the world. Our most reliable export is probably our culture. Whether you like Japanese food sometimes or all the time, or whether you like Mexican food sometimes or all the time, or Italian food, we, we really have this incredibly diverse 
actually interesting culture because of us benefiting from the multiple, uh, you know, ethnic diversity in our whole culture. So we like him a lot. And I have some dear buddies who are super innovative and savvy and smart and who are, in fact, Japanese origin, just like I'm, you know, part Cherokee American. And so uh, I get that it was tough to go to where your dad was interned. But I also remember my dad telling me about the sinking of the Vincennes once. He never told me again. And when he told me, he angrily ended his remembrance with sweat pouring down his face by telling me he would never talk about this ever again because it was the most frightening moment, of course, of his whole life. Your father, eight-year-old, was not a threat. He might have felt terrified. But I think it's better for our culture and our understanding to understand and empathize with both sides. And you clearly benefit by having this experience with your pop, and we benefit by being able to watch it. Our culture is enhanced by us being empathetic with both sides of this story. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. I think part of the reason this film has resonated is because it's not really taking a strong position in the sense that there are a lot of documentaries that I think are maybe heavy handed with sort of the interpretation of what is right and what's wrong. This really just sort of put thought starters out there. And, and the interesting thing, I think, from my father's perspective, I mentioned this earlier, that he doesn't harbor any resentment. If you ask him today what he thinks of the U.S., he will tell you it is the greatest country in the world. You know, after they left Manzanar, they moved to New Jersey because they lost everything in Los Angeles. They had a business, a house, they lost everything. And they had to start over in New Jersey. And so they lived in these low-cost housing that was built. They went to Seabrook Farms. So Charles Seabrook, who owned Chief Seabrook Farms was hiring Japanese that were coming out of the internment camp. So he said they got, got on these trains and they had tar paper over to want people to know that they were transporting Japanese, but they went across the country to New Jersey. And so that is where his formative, like where he grew up following an like, intern experience. And in order for him to sort of move up from the working class sort of environment, he joined the military, he enlisted. And so he served in the Air and the GI Bill allowed him to go to college and study and become an engineer. And to this day, if he is at like a July 4th parade, he will stand and salute the flag, right? And, and so I think that for me, it's so hard because I think, how could you have served a country that did that? But I, at the same time, I think he, he understands some of that complexity. I think that he feels that, you know, the country gave him a lot of opportunities that he might not have had otherwise. And so he is very patriotic about the country. And, and I think you can have an understanding of wanting to, you know, protect our national interests and, 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 and I think like this visceral reaction to aggression, but also maybe have some compassion and empathy, like you say, and sort of think about, are there ways for us to address this? Maybe that don't have that kind of an impact on young, sort of non-threatening citizens. And I think that's where, interestingly, some of the conversation that comes in this film like goes. One of the cultural adoptions that the Japanese have made after World War II from America is a love of baseball. And they're incredibly good at baseball. It's real fun. And I'm a season ticket holder at the San Francisco Giants and attended games the last two nights, Monday and Tuesday of this week. This is a fun thing to do. And at the games, there, there is the Star Spangled Banner, which is always recited at the beginning. Someone sings it at the ballpark. And I always stand, as I always have, and cross my heart. When your father is in such a setting, does he stand and cross his heart? Yeah, he does. exactly. So uh, one of the great parts about your fully American story is that your folks adopted a love of this country that interned him. And we developed a love of our new patriots, like your dad, who from humble roots recreated his life just like the Italians who came to New York, just like the Irish who came, just like every wave of immigrants that come, that in fact are inspired by the American dream and in fact live out that dream. So it's a great real American story that you have here and, and it's real fun for us to see it. Uh, so I have to ask, when you were at the award ceremony and you were watching the other nominees and your own film being reviewed, did you have already prepared an acceptance speech? We, uh, 
there are a lot of rules around the Emmys, which is kind of interesting. I, I brought I brought our Emmy just to kind of show it's real. It's a thing. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Every nominee is told to prepare, I think it's no more than 30 seconds of an acceptance speech. And you can only have, you can have as many people on the stage as you want, but only one person can give the speech. So in advance, I talked with Preeti and said, you know, you're the, the filmmaker. Like you should be the one to give the talk. So it's our story, but you've made it come to life. So she prepared something and I didn't know what she was going to say, but she, she did a lovely job. And, and we were just, I thought we were just going to forget everything when I got on stage, <laughs> but, but she did a wonderful job and we had a really warm reception by the audience. So. How does the making of this film rank in your father's remembrances of life? You know, it's funny. He's, I can't tell you how old he is now. He's in his late eighties because he doesn't want me to know. But I think that it is it is a highlight for him. It's funny because he he will say it. He's like, I, he says, I have to pinch myself because I never thought something like this would happen. I never thought I would be living this kind of life that I would have a story that anybody wanted to listen to, let alone we would re- receive this kind of recognition for. And so I think it's it's a in a strange way, like a a proud moment for him, but also in Congress, because he's like, it's just my life. It's just my history. Is it that worthy of recognition? And and it is. It clearly is. Well, congratulations on your uh, winning an Emmy, a great thing in your own life. And so fun that it's a family story and a very American story. And the fact that you could do just exactly what you've done, actually perpetuate this fun, wonderful American story is a great. Thanks so much for sharing it with our audiences at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. What a great job. And, and um, we're so happy for your success. And what would people do if they want to see the film? Where is it available at? KVIE's Sunday Stories. And I appreciate the exposure. We, we now have to figure out we have an Emmy. Like we have to, we have, there are people that work years <laughs> for that recognition. Well, great. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us at the Wednesday Audio Lunch. Thanks. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.